So what I want to do is talk to you about progress and challenges in Parkinson's disease. And the objective is going to be to, again, provide you some insight into recent advances in our understanding of Parkinson's etiology and treatment. And this is a very... Nick, are you, are Eric, are you getting her back there? You are? Okay. Does that seem like it's better? Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, I think if you're close to the microphone. All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that is much better. Awesome. Okay. So, again, what I want to do is give you some insight into recent advances into the understanding of Parkinson's easy etiology and treatment. And, again, this is a very vast field of research. And so what I'm going to do is focus it on some of the state-of-the-art state advances from our community in West Michigan. So I'm part of a group called Translational Science and Molecular Medicine at Michigan State. We're located in Grand Rapids. And again, as Sean said, we're going to be moving into a new research building very soon. So it's a very exciting time for us. Um, even though I'm going to focus on some of the research topics that is involved from our, um, or derived from our uh, research group, some of it will then parallel off into some more broader topics and stuff that I think you guys might be interested in. Um, since this is a small and informal group, if you guys have questions as I go along, I don't mind answering them uh, as we go. Otherwise, you can just wait till the end and I can answer questions then too. All right. So, to give you just a little bit of statistics about Parkinson's disease, Approximately 60,000 Americans are diagnosed newly with Parkinson's disease each year. And the incidence of Parkinson's increases with increasing age, but it is estimated that about 5% of persons with Parkinson's disease are diagnosed before the age of 50. As many as 1 million Americans live with Parkinson's disease, which is more than the combined number of people that have multiple sclerosis, uh, multiple muscular dystrophy, and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So it's estimated, again, that about 10 million people worldwide are living with Parkinson's disease. And as our population continues to age, this, shifts, this shift in um, a larger proportion of persons over the age of uh, 65 is estimated to uh, have a doubling in the incidence of Parkinson's disease in just over a decade, which is pretty remarkable. And so this continues to be an economic burden and a personal well-being burden to, to many people. It's uh, really staggering that the combined cost of Parkinson's disease, including treatment, social security payments, and lost income from the inability to work, is estimated to be about $25 billion per year just in the United States alone. So it's a pretty uh, impressive disease. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease is a chronic progressive movement disorder. Again, uh, the primary risk factor for Parkinson's disease is advanced age. So the average age of onset is around 67, 68 years of age. But again, between 2 and 5% of the cases uh, worldwide are estimated to, be, to occur uh, in people less than 50 years of age. The cause of Parkinson's disease, unfortunately, is unknown. However, the experts think that the disease is caused by a combination of genetic factors and environmental factors. And so there are probably causes of Parkinson's disease which probably vary from person to person. So the signs of Parkinson's disease, it's mostly, again, a motor disorder. And so the clinical motor signs are tremor at rest, uh, a slowness and poverty of movement, rigidity, flex posture, which is shown here, loss of postural reflexes, freezing behavior. And then there are also clinical non-motor symptoms that can be sometimes just as debilitating as the motor symptoms. But interestingly, the top five ones here are thought to be, uh, thought to occur mostly in the prodromal stages before the motor uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease can occur. And these are ones that if we could get a better handle on it, perhaps we could identify early stages of Parkinson's disease and when we have treatments, then be able to treat patients earlier. 
So even though back in this picture, this is sort of the prototypical picture that you'll often see in lectures of Parkinson's disease. So it's an older person, stooped posture. But the face of Parkinson's disease is actually much bigger than that. And I was trying to find some faces. And there's you know, some well-known ones. Michael J. Fox is one of the most well-known people. But this is from um, a, a particular website. And these are all people that are suffering from Parkinson's disease. So again, if there's 10 million people worldwide, a half million of those people are younger onset Parkinson patients. One of the uh, new persons that is a face of Parkinson's disease, many of you might know, uh, here in West Michigan. So Kirk Gibson was just diagnosed a couple of years ago with Parkinson's disease. He was an outfielder, oops, sorry about that. He was an outfielder for the Detroit Tigers, and he also played baseball and football at Michigan State. And so Kirk has um, uh, joined up with Michigan State and Van Andel Institute, and so far, I think Tim hasn't $1.2 million been donated in, in his honor. And so he's now in the fight against Parkinson's disease. So we don't know the etiology of Parkinson's disease, like I said, but we do know what the pathology is. So Parkinson's disease is a disorder involving death of a particular population of neurons that's located in your midbrain. So here you can see where it is in a person's um, head. So this population of neurons produces the neurotransmitter dopamine. And in Parkinson's disease, these neurons die off. And like all neurons, they send axonal projections to various parts of the brain. And their main target is an area of the brain called the striatum. It's a collectively known as the striatum. And when they release dopamine, we have normal motor learning, normal motor movement. When there is a death of these neurons, there's a decrease in dopamine in the striatum, and you get the classical motor deficits associated with Parkinson's disease. And so current therapies are aimed, as you might imagine, at replacing dopamine in the striatum. There's also experimental therapies aimed at preventing or delaying death of these nigral neurons, or trying to entice the remaining neurons that are living to regrow more axons to re the striatum, or perhaps replace some of those dopamine neurons by grafting ones in. But again, these are experimental. So what we're faced with at this point is pharmacotherapy, dopamine replacement. And so the main pharmacotherapy for Parkinson's disease is a drug called Cinnamit. There's several other dopamine replacement strategies, but this is the gold standard. Levodopa is the active ingredient in Cinnamit. It's the precursor to dopamine, so it's taken up readily into the brain, and it's converted to dopamine. And as you can see down here, this is a, a diagram that's quite old. It's more than you know a decade old, but it's still very true to the clinical course of uh, what you might expect to see in a Parkinson patient. So at some point, the patient is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And generally, they don't start on drug therapy for several years. That varies a lot. Once they start on drug therapy, there's what's called a honeymoon period. And levodopa, even though it develops, there are some side effects and motor symptoms become resistant eventually, it is truly a, a miracle drug. And so there's this honeymoon period. But eventually, again, there develop these motor complications that I'm going to talk to you about at the end of the talk, and then symptoms become resistant to these uh, therapies. So there's a lot of research trying to figure out why do side effects develop? That's what my laboratory is interested in. And why does efficacy eventually wane? Well, it's doubtless related to the fact that the levodopa is converted primarily, but not exclusively, in those dopamine terminals to dopamine. So if you're losing those, that would stand to reason that that's why you're losing efficacy. But what happens to those neurons up in the striatum that, those neurons, or that the dopamine neurons normally talk to once they lose their dopamine? Is there some sort of pathology that occurs up there that might contribute to some of this? So let's look at the idea of loss of dopamine terminals. There was a study by a colleague of ours down at Rush University, Dr. Jeffrey Cordover, that he published a couple years ago. And so this shows a coronal section through the striatum. And what I've done is put in little uh, cartoons of substantia nigra dopamine neurons. And this arrow indicates the afferent axons projecting up into the striatum and what they've done in this postmortem um, tissue section from a control age match uh, person is staying for an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase, which is in dopamine neurons. And you can see in a normal person, there's an abundance of dopamine terminals. But as Parkinson's disease progresses and you lose your substantia nigra dopamine neurons, 
you also lose these dopamine terminals. And you actually lose those more impressively and more fast. It's thought to be an axonopathy rather than a neuronal, neuronal pathology. And it turns out that around three to five years is when you start really seeing this remarkable denervation of the striatum. And this is the period where you start seeing these motor complications. So, does dopamine loss up in the striatum cause problems? Well, we've known for a really long time that yes, indeed, it does. So back in 1988, Tom McNeil and his colleagues were the first to show that these neurons, this is a medium spiny neuron up in the striatum, it changes quite a bit with Parkinson's disease pathology with the loss of dopamine in the striatum. So if we can prevent the progressive loss of dopamine neurons, can we prevent striatal pathology and pro prolong effective therapy? And if we can prevent loss of those dopamine neurons, we can just prevent the progression of Parkinson's disease. So there's an enormous amount of research that's going on in the world to try and figure out um, how we can do that. Are there any hopeful therapies on the horizon for slowing the death of those nigral dopamine neurons? Well, in order to be able to slow the death and to stop the etiology, we need to know what causes death of those nigral dopamine neurons. And so what I'm going to do right now is go through the emerging thoughts on what causes death of those dopamine neurons. Again, we don't really know what the causes are. However, as I said, advanced age is the greatest risk factor for developing Parkinson's disease. It's also thought that our environment, our lifestyle, and our genetics probably all work in some combination to result in abnormalities in a particular protein in our brain called alpha-synuclein. And so, like all proteins, they have to fold in order to be in a particular conformation to be biologically active. And so normally, alpha-synuclein is made, it folds properly, and it has its normal function. In Parkinson's disease, it's thought that one or more of these factors, advanced age, genetic predisposition, factors in the environment, cause toxic clumping and misfolding of those proteins. Question? Um, I, I seem to remember, was that chromosome 15? Or what chromosome, the gene that determines that protein? Do you know what, what chromosome number? I don't remember um, what that. Because Oh. Yeah, I don't remember what the chromosome is. There are mutations that result in overproduction, duplication, and triplication um, issues with that. And I don't remember what chromosome it is. There's, I think, nine or ten different genetic causes of Parkinson's disease, which is giving us some insight. And one of them is related to overproduction. And it's interesting that it seems like all the neurodegenerative diseases, at least the emerging view right now, is that whether it's prion disease, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, all probably are related to this protein misfolding. But it's a different protein in each different disease. So, yeah, I'm sorry I don't know that. But it's thought that this protein misfolding then ends up resulting in neuronal dysfunction and neuron death, specifically of the substantia nigra neurons in Parkinson's disease and the eventual emergence of Parkinson's disease. So what is alpha-synuclein? Well, it's an essential and abundant protein that's found in almost all neurons, I think all neurons. Um, in fact, you know, of the tens of thousands of proteins in the brain, 2% of the brain's protein is alpha-synuclein. So it's very abundant and obviously very important. But studies suggest that alpha-synuclein exists under different conformational shapes and forms, and that different genetic aspects can cause different changes in this protein. And it's thought that misfolding or aggregation of alpha-synuclein ends up cause or leading to something called a Lewy body. And you can see an example of a Lewy body right here and it's taken up most of the cell body. And you can imagine that that's probably not very healthy. But we don't know if that's the toxic element or if it has something to do with the misfolding of the protein. So down here we have normal unfolded monomer of alpha-synuclein. And sometimes it can be formed uh, into dimers. But it turns out that, again, under certain genetic, um, in certain genetic 
uh, predisposed people and under conditions of perhaps aging or environmental factors, that alpha-synuclein can start turning into dimers, oligomers, and propagate into these fibrils and eventually end up uh, resulting in these Lewy bodies. Again, we don't know which of these substances along the way are the toxic uh, substance. But these events of propagating and misfolding and fibril formation are thought to be crucial factors in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. So you can get to a city by lots of different routes. So you can get there by genetic changes, environmental changes, aging, but it's thought that perhaps this misfolding event is a, a final common pathway for uh, death of these dopamine neurons. So if misfolded protein, misfolded alpha-synuclein, eventually ends up causing neuronal dysfunction and death, can we prevent Parkinson's disease or its progression by preventing the toxic protein misfolding? And so this is something that's very much of interest in the field of Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to share with you some of the work that's going on in uh, West Michigan in the laboratory of Dr. Tim Collier, and he can answer questions about the stuff I'm going to show <laughs> of his here in just a few minutes. But the other thing that's very much of interest in the field of neurodegeneration is repurposing drugs. So why are we interested in repurposing drugs? Well, the idea is that we can explore the use of drugs that already have FDA approval for a specific indication, for example, drugs that are used for depression, as their effects may apply to treating another indication, for example, Parkinson's disease. And so this provides a faster route to clinical application because drugs first have to go through safety testing through the FDA then they can go into efficacy testing. So if you've already got a drug that's FDA approved and known to be safe in clinical populations, we can skip that safety uh, testing aspect, avoid that delay, and begin testing immediately the efficacy in treating Parkinson's disease. So repurposing is very much of interest in the field of neurodegeneration right now. So again, Dr. Collier and his colleagues many years ago became interested in the idea of repurposing drugs for maybe slowing down progression of Parkinson's disease, and the drug they chose was an antidepressant. Why in the world would they choose an antidepressant? Well, the reason? What's that? <laughs> I thought maybe somebody knew. <laughs> well, it turns out that antidepressants are thought to work by stimulating trophic factors, so factors that can help repair the brain. They also can reduce some of the key pathology that's known to be associated with Parkinson's disease, including inflammation, oxidative stress, and they can stimulate something called autophagy, help to, oops, sorry, help to clear some of those toxic proteins that are misfolding and clumping in the brain. So Dr. Collier and his student, Katrina Pommier, uh, who is now at Washington University, uh, began a study. And they were interested in whether these multifunctional drugs with lots of different uh, mechanisms of action that are already FDA approved could impact Parkinson's disease. Question. If you skip the safety testing, you're going to have to say, what's the fast track time to get through? But how long does it still take? Yeah, and so that's something that Dr. Collier could probably address better. But if you skip that part, how long does the efficacy yeah. testing go? So then, um, an efficacy trial is usually about three years long. Oh, okay. And so it, it cuts it in half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it cuts the money more than in half. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, great question. So, their study of looking at whether antidepressants could help forestall the progression of Parkinson's disease has recently cumul uh, culminated in this publication that has caused quite a bit of stir in the press in the, the region here. So I don't know if any of you guys saw uh, Dr. Collier on Fox, or on Wood News, sorry, and then he's been in a, a several different publications and stuff. So there's a lot of great interest in this paper that they saw. What they ended up reporting in this paper is that nortriptyline could slow progression of Parkinson's disease. Well, what is nortriptyline, and how did they get on this? So nortriptyline is what's called a tricyclic antidepressant. It's been FDA approved for more than 50 years, so it's been around for a very long time. 
It's primarily, primarily used to treat depression and chronic pain. And interestingly, it's found to be superior to the newer drugs like the SSRIs and the SNRIs um, for treatment of depression in Parkinson's disease specifically. So what they were interested in doing and how they kind of started their mission in trying to figure out if antidepressants would work was they did what was called data mining. And this is involved, involves reanalyzing evidence from clinical trials. And so Dr. Collier and Dr. Pommier ended up going back and looking at existing information from a large cohort of patients in uh, Parkinson's disease clinical trials in something called the Parkinson's study group. So it's, it's groups of Parkinson's patients located throughout the United States. But they asked a new question that had not been asked of this data that was existing. Their question specifically was, if a newly diagnosed PD individual had a history of taking antidepressant medicine, did it delay their need for standard cinnamate levodopa uh, replacement therapy? Specifically, was their progression to needing disease or medication slower? So was their disease progression slower? They went through information from over 2,000 newly diagnosed patients, so less than five years from diagnosis, and these patients had not yet taken any kind of medication. They asked the question of whether any kind of antidepressant might slow progression of the disease, need for starting on um, uh, drug therapy. And then they also looked by different classes. So they looked at the ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, selective norepinephrine reuptake uh, up, uh, inhibitors, and then the tricyclic antidepressants. And what they found was two things. First, they found that depression largely goes untreated in the Parkinson's disease community. Of the more than 2,000 people that were in the study, only 451 of them uh, were being treated for depression. And it's known that about 50% of people with Parkinson's disease suffer from depression. And it's thought to be, as I showed in that non-motor part of the symptoms of, of Parkinson's disease, that depression is a very large part of Parkinson's disease and is probably part of the underlying um, uh, issue with dopamine depletion. And the other thing they found was that tricyclic antidepressants, like nortriptyline, were the only ones that were associated with a lower probability of starting cinnamon therapy. And so this is just one graph from their uh, paper of this data mining study. And what we're going to look at is this thing called a hazard ratio. And what a hazard ratio is, is that if it's a score of one, it means you have a normal progression to Parkinson's disease. With tricyclic antidepressants and amitriptyline, which is broken down to nortriptyline, which is the active ingredient of am amitriptyline, you end up having a hazard ratio of 0.3, which means you have a 70% reduced likelihood of starting levodopa therapy after just two years. So quite remarkable. So they, of course, wanted to know why this was. Not just because they're scientists and they're curious, but if we understand why this is happening, we might understand better the etiology of what's causing Parkinson's disease and help us to develop better therapies for the Parkinson patients. So again, alpha-synuclein is this abundant protein in the brain and has very important normal functions, obviously. When it clumps together or aggregates, this again is the uh, hallmark pathology of Parkinson's disease, so it's difficult to design therapies that will maintain the normal function and selectively interfere with pathological clumps. That's why there's this great unmet need right now and a lot of interest in trying to develop these therapies. You need to be able to target the bad aspects, but not the good aspects. So what Dr. Collier did was collaborated with Dr. Le Lisa Lapidus, who is a physicist on the main campus in East Lansing at MSU. And she was working on drugs and protein interactions. And what she ended up finding out was that in test tubes, nortriptyline actually attaches to alpha-synuclein. And it keeps it in its normal form, and it prevents all of this clumping. So it was very intriguing. But they didn't know, is this how it's working in the patients to slow progression of needing to start on their drug? Does this work the same way in an animal model? And so to ask these questions in an animal model, we can develop Parkinsonian rats. 
They're rendered Parkinsonian by stereotaxic injection of a toxin. So we use these modified stereotaxic apparatuses that are designed for mice and rats. They're very similar to what they use in patients. And so what we can do is stereotaxically inject, say, a chemical to kill off the nigral dopamine neurons and induce Parkinsonism in the rat. But what uh, Dr. Collier and his group did, and Dr. Pomying, was they injected something called preformed fibrils. And so these are alpha-synuclein that started fibrilizing. It, it can become very sticky, and they can make these preformed fibrils. And what they found out in this manuscript was if they inject it into the striatum, it gets translocated back to the substantia nigra, and it seeds aggregation in those dopamine neurons, and it results in death of those nigral dopamine neurons. So we have this wonderful method of looking to see how preformed fibrils or alpha-synuclein aggregation might be stopped by nortriptyline. So they injected the preformed fibrils into the striatum, and they gave nortriptyline at a couple of different doses. And so what they found was that in a normal young rat, you never see any of these fibrils. And so TH is the um, enzyme that is a dopamine marker, and you can see this is a substantia nigra with lots of dopamine neurons. And they looked here at these fibrils prior to when they would have caused um, early or death of those nigral dopamine neurons. At this point, they're just looking at whether it impacts the um, aggregation. And you can see that here there's red marker is the misfolded alpha-synuclein. And here in a different stain, you can see all of these little aggregates back in the substantia nigra in an animal that received uh, these preformed fibrils and just the control vehicle saline. When they gave nortriptyline to these animals at a low dose, they saw there was a reduction in those aggregations. And at a higher dose, there was a complete amelioration in the uh, number of those aggregations. So in an animal model, this also works to prevent aggregation of the alpha-synuclein. So nortriptyline, again, is an FDA-approved drug with a long history of safety and efficacy in treatment of depression and chronic pain. So it's a candidate for drug repurposing. It's been proven, again, to nicely have superior treatment um, for depression in people with Parkinson's disease. And nortriptyline, again, has multiple actions. Again, these are things that Dr. Collier can talk to you about um, afterwards if anybody is interested in it. So it's a very complex drug with a lot of different activities that may be beneficial, one being that it can prevent the aggregation of alpha-synuclein. So it's a complex drug for a complex disease that may have multiple insults causing death of those neurons. And their new findings again, show that nortriptyline attaches to alpha-synuclein, maintaining it in its normal function, which is very important, and preventing the toxic clumping. So this suggests that starting nortriptyline in Parkinson's disease as early as possible has the potential to slow the pathology, slow the progression of symptoms, and allow patients to live well. And if we can find an early biomarker before motor onset, we could start patients on something like this, and perhaps they would never develop the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So this is that, uh, the story of, of uh, what's been going on here in West Michigan. And then as a parallel, again, this is something that's very much of interest, and I wanted to give you a little more information on it, because some people had been asking me about another study that also came out looking at um, diminishing alpha-synuclein in the brain that has also made a little bit of a, a splash in the, um, the literature. And so this is on the Michael J. Fox Foundation website, and Dr. Scherzer, Clemens Scherzer, at Harvard University, and he was just in Grand Rapids a couple days ago. Unfortunately, he didn't talk about this study, but what, his, uh, what he and his colleagues showed was that an asthma drug may also help prevent Parkinson's disease through interfering with alpha-synuclein. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit about this. And then this kind of opens up a whole can of worms about how we need to think about this uh, therapeutic development uh, impacting alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease. So what's all the fuss about? It all came about from their manuscript. And again, this just came out, I don't know if you can see that, September 1st, 2017. Um, so that one and then the, the nortriptyline by Dr. Collier both came out about the same time, and they both have very exciting um, data. And so what they end up talking about here in their abstract is that, and I mentioned it a little bit, copy number mutations in particular genes, and I don't remember what the name, which gene it is, but there are duplication and triplication um, uh, genetic mutations that cause young onset Parkinson's disease. And so the, uh, the cause of 
the people that get this young onset Parkinson's disease is uh, due to the fact that they have too much alpha-synuclein, which apparently results in this misfolding and death of those neurons. So too much alpha-synuclein is a causative factor in Parkinson's disease. That's part of the dogma out there. So what these pay, um, investigators did was, over 11 years, they did another data mining experiment. And they looked at 4 million Norwegian individuals, and they found that the brain-penetrant asthma medication, salbutamol, um, reduces the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Their hazard ratio is about 0.66, so there's about a 34% reduction in the uh, incidence of, of uh, Parkinson's disease with this drug. This um, asthma medication is a beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. They also found then that if people were taking a beta-2 adrenergic receptor antagonist, it increased their risk. So this was very important because it shows the specificity of that receptor. And so these drugs can sometimes be taken actually for depression or heart disease. What they ended up finding in this paper was that the beta-2 adrenergic receptor is a regulator of alpha-synuclein. Very interesting, very unexpected. So what they did was they looked at 1,126 FDA-approved drugs, and they show three of them here. One of them is the salbutamol, and then they went on and do, did most of their studies with something called clenbuterol. But what they found was that uh, compared to controls, these beta-2 agonists could reduce the abundance of alpha-synuclein message and protein. And so what they suggest is that this receptor is linked to the transcription of alpha-synuclein and could reduce alpha-synuclein production, so perhaps it's something that could be a potential target for future therapies. So there are five companies out there now, and in this, again, is information taken from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, that are very interested in these studies where they can um, impact alpha-synuclein and prevent Parkinson's disease. So this is one of the main focuses of the Michael J. Fox Foundation right now. And so they list five of these companies that have these therapies. Three of them are directed at antibody production. So producing an antibody so that your own body can break down and reduce the amount of alpha-synuclein you have in your brain. So this is similar to, oops, this is similar to that albutamol um, asthma medication. The other two studies are looking at agents that bind to uh, alpha-synuclein and block its accumulation. One of them is, um, uh, binds to alpha-synuclein and other proteins, again, that misfold in Alzheimer's disease. And so these are aimed at preventing the misfolding of the protein, sort of like the nortriptyline. So the thing about these is that these are all in phase one clinical trials. So we've got an FDA-approved drug, the albutamol, that can reduce alpha-synuclein, and we've got the nortriptyline already that have been through the safety trials that can now be started in the, uh, the efficacy part of the, uh, the trials. So, there's controversy in the field. The current neuroprotective therapies, most of them, and you can see that from the top three, are aimed at reducing alpha-synuclein in the brain. So, again, I keep saying this, it's an abundant and critical protein. While overexpression is definitely linked to genetic forms, what happens if we reduce alpha-synuclein throughout your brain? Too much, we know, is not good. Duplication, triplication, mutations cause Parkinson's disease. Too little might not be good also. There's something known as the Goldilocks effect. And most biological effects are U-shaped, you know, inverse U-shaped curves. So we know that too much alpha-synuclein is not good for neuron viability. Is too little not good? Is there a sweet spot? of needing alpha-synuclein to have neuron viability? And the answer is, yeah, we're beginning to understand if we take out too much, that's not going to be good. And again, this is very, very controversial, even though there's really strong evidence to suggest that, that we need to use caution. So Dr. Frederick Manfredson, who's now at um, Michigan State in our group, 
was the first one that looked at this. And what they did was they developed these small interfering RNAs. And they had three of them that they injected into the substantia nigra. And just look at this bottom picture here. This is in the substantia nigra. And the red images here is alpha-synuclein staining in nigral neurons. They inject their SI RNA, and they can knock out most of the um, uh, alpha-synuclein in those dopamine neurons. Not only do they significantly diminish alpha-synuclein, but they significantly ablate the number of tyrosine hydroxylase dopamine neurons. So here you can see the injected side, that's a stain for that tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme. It's reduced up in the striatum. And again, they have different siRNAs that cause differing amounts of decrease in alpha-synuclein, and they cause differing amounts, an egregious amount of cell death, a moderate amount of cell death, and a less moderate amount of cell death. So if you take out alpha-synuclein, it doesn't look like it's so good. This has been recapitulated and confirmed in non-human primates, so maybe this is just unique to rats. But Again, Dr. Collier and Dr. Manfredson did this study where they developed, Dr. Manfredson developed this viral vector where they could put in a short hairpin RNA that interferes with alpha-synuclein production. So they injected on one side of that rat, or the monkey, and the substantia nigra in a primate is much more complex than in the rat. There's what's called a dorsal tear and a ventral tear. And in Parkinson's disease, the ventral tear dopamine neurons die off first. What they see when they knock down alpha-synuclein is that the ventral tear, no other toxins are given. You're just knocking down alpha-synuclein. You totally wipe out those, and you can see there's a decrease in the dopamine innervation up in the striatum. So these uh, data suggest that extreme caution needs to be uh, used in developing these therapies aimed at reducing alpha-synuclein in the brain. So there's great hope on the horizon, but again, we have to be very careful. So, until we have a cure, how do we improve symptomatic treatment with Parkinson's disease? So I'm going to end in the next 10 minutes or so by showing you some of the work that's coming out of my laboratory addressing this issue. And so, again, what I showed you before is that, you know, most patients, again, after they start on uh, levodopa therapy, they have this money honeymoon period, but then three to five years later, they start developing these motor complications. And the principal motor complication, the one that's most debilitating for Parkinson patients, is something called levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And so this is a, a picture of a patient from Dr. Kathleen Shannon down at Rush University. And levodopa-induced dyskinesias are abnormal involuntary movements that can dramatically affect quality of life. They include dystonia, so abnormal muscle tone. And this patient has such severe dystonia of her, I guess it's her right ankle that she has to wear a brace because the muscles are so contracted that it's very painful for her. Then she has unwanted dance-like and repetitive movements. You can imagine if she had coffee in this cup that she would just be spilling it everywhere. It's very difficult for uh, patients with severe dyskinesias to have normal quality of life. Dyskinesia characteristics in rats and non-human primates and, and mice are very similar to humans. They uh, also are, have the same kind of um, motor behaviors. Their, their motor programs are slightly different because you have a biped versus a uh, quadruped, but you can see here that this rat, if he had, again had a coffee cup in his hand, he'd be looking very similar to that patient. So, so we're able to quantify these. And they have very similar neurochemical and pharmacological characteristics that allow us then to test some preclinical ideas. And so my lab is interested in trying to figure out how we can improve therapeutics in Parkinson's disease. And so just two years ago was the 50th anniversary of the introduction of, Parkin or of levodopa for Parkinson patients. And in the beginning, it was written that levodopa is an interesting uh, theoretical drug, but it'll never be something that'll be used for patients because of all the side effects. They knew right from the beginning that levodopa-induced dyskinesias, and, and then they didn't know about peripheral decarboxylase inhibitors, and they had problems with, you know, all kinds of nausea and side effects from, from that kind of thing. But we've known about dyskinesias for 50 years. There's been a lot of research into it over the last couple of decades. We know genes that change. We know mechanisms, you know, galore that are changing. But currently, there is one drug that's partially effective in a subpopula subpopulation of patients for a couple of years to treat dyskinesias. So we really need help in being able to improve therapeutics uh, in this regard. So the question is, why do side effects develop uh, when we give levodopa? Is it again related to this loss of the dopamine terminals? So 
it's an interesting coincidence, perhaps, that levodopa induced dyskinesias begin generally three to five years after the introduction of, of levodopa therapy. And this happens to be the time that there is that reduction of the, the striatal dopamine. We know also that a loss of dopamine causes pathology up in the striatum. Those neurons that normally receive dopamine are changing in all kinds of different ways to try and compensate for the lack of dopamine, and then eventually they end up having all of this severe pathology. So what we study is this neuron, and I want to give you a little bit of background on it, which will give you uh, an understanding of the therapy that we're, we're working on now. So the medium spiny neuron is the primary neuron in the striatum. So 95 to 98% of all the neurons in the striatum are these medium spiny neurons. They are the primary neuron to receive afer afferent input. Massive information from motor cortex and other areas comes into the striatum to help us learn motor behavior and execute motor behavior. And this input comes in and impinges upon the multiple spines that are on these neurons. Information also ascends from the substantia nigra and innervates these neurons. And then these neurons also talk across the, the striatum and help spread information. And they're the primary output neuron. So they're a very important neuron. So the cytoarchitecture of these neurons is very critical. So these, this is the cell body cartoon of this neuron. This is one of the dendrites that receives all that information. And you can see all of this massive information that comes from the cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex it's excitatory glutamatergic input. And dopamine then ascends from the substantia nigra, and it impinges upon the neck of the same spine that those cortical neurons impinge upon on the head. The dopamine neuron acts as a gas or brake pedal. It allows more or less information from the cortex to be brought into the medium spiny neuron. And normal motor behavior depends on this normal dopamine glutamate interaction at these spines. So these spines are a very important cytoarchitectural and biochemical compartment. So Parkinson's disease is a progressive disorder. As it progresses from mild to moderate to severe, there's more and more denervation of the striatum, less and less dopamine in the striatum, and that is accompanied by less and less dendritic spines on those medium spiny neurons. It turns out that levodopa efficacy begins to wane and the side effects begin to emerge at this point where we're losing dendritic spines. So our question is, does dendritic spine loss contribute or underlie therapy dysfunction? So what we did was we undertook this study with some very talented collaborators of ours back in Chicago and this wonderful uh, graduate student, Cynthia Zhang. And we filled these neurons with something called Golgi impregnation that allowed us to look at all the different attributes of the morphology of these neurons. And then Cynthia did this electron microscopy so she could look at the characteristics of the synapses that came in and made contacts on the medium spiny neurons. So here's a little cartoon of a medium spiny neuron. Here's one of its dendrites. It's got all the spines. This is under the normal conditions. Got the glutamate coming down onto the head of the spine from the cortex. Dopamine coming into the neck of the spine and that kind of thing. We lesioned the animals with 6-hydroxydopamine, a chemical that kills off those dopamine neurons. We made them severely Parkinsonian, so we had dopamine loss, and as predicted, we lost dendritic spines. The first, this was the first study that actually showed an electron microscopic example that when you lose those spines, now where does the cortical glutamate make a contact? You lose the cortical input. When we gave levodopa to these animals that had spine loss, we ended up seeing something really interesting. We saw a restoration of spine number and a restoration of the cortical striatal inputs, but only in the animals that became dyskinetic. That didn't make any sense. But if you look carefully at it, there are enlarged spines. There's multiple inputs onto a single spine. There's all kinds of changes that happen that look like there's a miswiring in the dyskinetic striatum. So, despite a progressive loss of dopamine neurons, until we can find a way to stop that progressive loss, if we could prevent striatal pathology, could we prolong effective therapy and prevent these dyskinesias? So, what causes the loss of those spines? If we maintain dendritic spines in the striatum, 
could we prevent this miswiring? And so here was our rationale. So this is the normal brain. We're going to lesion the substantia nigra and lose the red input. So we've lost dopamine, but if we can maintain those spines, then we could maintain the glutamate input. And if we gave levodopa in the absence of spine loss, could we then have no dyskinesias? That was our hypothesis, that we, if we could preserve the normal inputs, we would prevent aberrant synapse formation and aberrant dyskinetic behavior. But we have a model requirement. We need to be able to have severe dopamine depletion and maintain dendritic spine density. So luckily, some other talented colleagues down in Chicago, Michelle Day, who was a postdoc in Jim Surmeyer's lab at Northwestern, ended up finding out that spine density in the medium spiny neurons are regulated by a particular calcium channel. So they're called an intraspinous calcium channel. It's called a CAV 1.3, calcium voltage gated 1.3. And dopamine regulates the opening of these channels. So there's the link between Parkinson's disease and the loss of the spines. So dopamine normally modulates the opening of these and allows a normal amount of calcium to enter. We all know if you have too much calcium in your neurons, it's not good. So when we lose nigrostriatal dopamine terminals, we get an unregulated activity of these calf channels, massive increase in calcium retraction in the spines, loss of the cortical striatal inputs. So are there drugs that work at the CAV 1.3 channels? Yes, there are. The drugs, unfortunately, though, mostly work at a different channel, the CAV 1.2 channel. They're called dihydropyridines, isratapine, nemotapine. They're commonly used for cardiac uh, patients. And so the CAV 1.2 channels are in the heart, the CAV 1.3 channels, there's 1.2 in the brain too, but the CAV 1.3 are in the brain. So I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. But we have shown, and another group, so our group, this is Soderstrom et al., my student, and another group at Northwestern and then their collaborators in France have shown that if we can give nemotapine or isratapine, we can have severe dopamine depletion and maintain dendritic spine density to normal. So what we did was to see if this would prevent levodopa-induced dyskinesias, and I've just got a few more slides here, is that we lesioned our animals with stereotaxic surgery. Half the animals received nemotapine slow-release pellets that prevented the spine loss, and half the animals were allowed to undergo the normal spine loss that they uh, do, uh, or that they see with uh, dopamine depletion. What we ended up seeing is that when we gave nemotapine in the presence of a high dose of levodopa, was that on the first day of chronic daily levodopa, or subchronic just once a week, and there was a reason we did it this way, but initially there was a prevention of levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And our colleagues in France and down in Chicago saw the same thing with low-dose levodopa, six milligrams per kilogram with isratapine. But again, we all saw over time that this effect was lost. So it told us, though, that this might be a very interesting target. But there's compelling evidence to suggest that the limitation in scope, not complete prevention, and the loss of protection over time in our study and in the French study may be related to the efficacy of the drugs that are currently available for the CAV 1.3 channel. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but again, the selectivity of all FDA-approved drugs or all drugs that are available for CAV 1.3 inhibition principally work at the CAV 1.2 channels. And even if we can get the drug concentration high enough, those drugs just don't completely inhibit the CAV 1.3 channels. And if we do give drugs, and if you gave them in patients, you're going to give it non-continuously. So, you know, that kind of leaves um, some issues that uh, we're not getting uh, complete, constant uh, inhibition of these channels. So we wanted to know if these limitations and why the anti-dyskinetic potential of CAV 1.3 antagonism wanes over time is related to the uh, inferior quality of the drugs that are available. So we worked with this Dr. Frederick Manfredson again who developed those siRNAs that knocked down the um, alpha synuclein and he developed um, a, um, a viral vector for us that would knock down and silence the CAV channels in a continuous high potency target selective only in the striatum uh, continuous way. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but you can see that when we inject it, um, it fills the striatum mostly, at least in the area we're interested in. And these brown uh, puncta here are messenger RNA 
for the cap channel. And in our vectored animals, you can see that there's a significant diminution in that, that messenger RNA for the cap channels. We don't want it to be completely quieted because we need some calcium activity. So we've got about 70 to 80% with this cap channel. So we injected our shRNA into the striatum. We lesioned our animals, and it takes about four weeks for this to ramp up in maximal production. We then started giving the animals levodopa. We started with a low dose. Then we decided if that was protective, we would go up to a moderate dose, and then our traditional high dose that we usually do. Is, and we thought if there's protection there, we'll go to this excessive dose. So what we ended up seeing, I go downstairs and I'm rating these animals, looking at their behavior. And we've got the animals with the CAV shRNA and the scrambled controls. CAV is in red, black is the scrambled. It's day one. There's not too much dyskinesia, and there's no difference. I was so disappointed. Then I went down, we gave each of these doses over two weeks. On day six, and it's starting to look like maybe there's a little bit of separation. So this is the average, and then these are the individual animals. And it's still a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of noise. By the 10th day, things are starting to look pretty interesting. And we're starting to get some significant difference. And to cut to the chase, what we ended up finding over our low, moderate, high, and holy cow high, dose was that we saw this amazing diminution of levodopa-induced dyskinesias that lasted for a very long time. This is something I have never seen in the 20 years, almost 20 years, that I've been doing this research in any kind of study. But what we've seen is that with even excessively high dose of levodopa, we could only give this every other day because it was such a high dose. And a cumulative two months of daily levodopa you can see how tight this data is. I've never seen anything come out quite that tight. It's very, very impressive. So we're super excited about this, and the university is very excited about it for patent reasons and all kinds of stuff. But the main thing we're interested in is this may be something that could finally give some benefit to the patients. But our, we needed to also then answer, does the CAV silencing just interfere with dopamine release? Because you can prevent levodopa-induced dyskinesias with all kinds of things, like a dopamine antagonist will completely knock out levodopa-induced dyskinesias, but it completely knocks out the motor benefit. So we have some animals that we're going to send out to a collaborator of ours who looks at in vivo dialysis release of dopamine. But in the meantime, we've done some behavioral study, and we've looked at motoric behavior that's stimulated when you give dopamine agonist or levodopa. And so what we ended up seeing is that rearing behavior was increased mostly in the calf animals. It wasn't quite significant at this low dose in the scrambled animals, suggesting that maybe there's more dopamine actually being released. And I can tell you these animals are very active. They don't just go in the corner and sleep. And then when we look at rotational behavior, again, low dose levodopa markedly increases these motor behaviors, both in the calf animals and in the scrambled controls. So, so what's next on the horizon for Parkinson's disease? So there's promising evidence that suggests that we're getting a more accurate understanding of at least one key underlying mechanism, alpha-synuclein, in the death of nigral dopamine neurons. This has been very exciting in the field. There are promising uh, therapeutics on the horizon for slowing progression of the disease and perhaps even preventing, again, if we can figure out biomarkers to detect the disease early enough through interfering with alpha-synuclein aggregation. And we're starting to really get a handle on some promising evidence that CAV 1.3 may be a very interesting target for preventing and maybe reversing levodopa-induced dyskinesias. So we gave this, um, we knocked out, the, uh, we silenced the channels before we started the pa uh, patients, sorry, the rats on levodopa. So this would be a scenario for early patients. What about those patients that already have levodopa-induced dyskinesias? Will that reverse it? We have that study ongoing, which is why I thought it was going to be late today because I was doing that behavioral rating. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but it looks like it may be reversing it too, but we'll see. So, But one of the things that we are still challenged with is getting these promising therapies into clinical trials. So again, this nortriptyline is so promising. But Dr. Collier now is trying to work, and he can tell you about it, with the NIH and various funding agencies to try and get funding to take this into the patients. So there are so many things that are being developed in the laboratories, but getting it to the patients, there's something called the valley of death. And trying to get funding for clinical trials is quite, quite an egregious endeavor. 
So that is something that we're certainly faced with. And I'd like to uh, end by acknowledging all of my collaborators. Uh, these are the group of people that I work with. I have the pleasure of working with them every single day. And the, group, or the, the work has been supported by the NIH, the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, and then MSU has some uh, funding that they've been very generous in, in giving to these projects too. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure Dr. Collier also would be happy to answer any questions. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.